Wow. Well, thank you um, incredibly much for inviting me and for that extraordinary introduction. I'm really honored to be speaking to you. I've been drinking in everything that's been, well, whatever I was able to go to between the panels of, of, of what's been happening, and I'm, um, it's, been, it's been really, really fascinating. So I hope that uh, what I'm going to share today will be of use also uh, in some way. I don't, I hope it, I don't know if it will live up to the, or the orgasmic possibility of the ending of the conference, or maybe that comes afterwards, but um, I'm going to start with some things that are very connected to this book, so uh, it will draw on that. I'm not going to read any passages or give you anything directly from the book, because obviously it's a book, you can get it. I will give you some things that are related but are not in the book, uh, and that's to sketch an epistemic context for martial arts practice and to talk about what that means. Epistemic just means knowledge, basically, focusing on knowledge, thinking about knowledge, talking about knowledge, and it's fairly uncontroversial, I think, to suggest that a major part of martial arts practice is knowledge. Um, but if we dig into that, we can, I think, go, go further and, 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 and find new ways of thinking about the practice and maybe even, maybe even new new practices or new ways of framing the practice that generate new practice. I think there's more to be said there about the way that knowledge functions there. I'm not, uh, not going to focus too much on any specific martial arts at all. That's really not my area of expertise, much more uh, many other people here. So I'm talking around martial arts. I'm talking about a context for martial arts. I'm talking about martial arts in relation to other embodied practices. Uh, and, 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 and Towards the end, after I talk about some theory, after I offer some theoretical possibilities, theoretical tools, then I'd like to talk about some projects that I'm working on now uh, and propose some, some things that I'm doing and, and some things that are open for participation as well, uh, some questions that we could think about going forward. But I actually want to start with something by Paul because this is the reason that I wrote to Paul was this article that I found in the Jomex, so it's before the, the Martial Arts Studies Journal. Uh, <coughs> which is about the problem of realness. And he talks about the reality drive, which is so often coupled with the disavowal of institutionality. And the beginning of the abstract suggests that there's maybe some tension between the desire for reality and the inevitable emergence of institutional styles. And that, for me, uh, goes m far beyond martial arts studies, martial arts practice. It goes actually beyond beyond all kinds of embodied practice, because this question of realness, the problem of realness, is also of major concern in a lot of areas of contemporary philosophy. How do we grapple with realness? What is this realness? And in the martial arts context, on the one hand, we have something absolutely concrete. I mean, it's the, it's the poetically concrete illustration of what realness is, right? If someone's sitting there saying, maybe reality doesn't exist, you hit him. That's the, that's the canonical example, right? And if you meet the Buddha, you kill him. So the violence there, there's a reality there that can be a grounding point. But if that were the only grounding point, then a lot of the conversations in martial arts studies wouldn't be developing as they are because some of what's going on there is to say, sure, that's a grounding, part, grounding point. That's a kind of grounding. Something foundational is there in that realness, but it's not there in a simple way because if it were, you'd just be able to rank the martial arts in terms of which one gets at the realness best, uh, and then you'd be done. But instead, you have this bounty of diversify, d diversifying styles. You have growth of styles, closure of styles, branching points. You have this very lively culture, different places of the world, exploring in different ways, and yet there's this realness somehow. So how then do we, so, so this, is this tension between the, the multiplicity of the practices and this idea that there's something concrete there, that it's not just, it's not entirely relativist. So it's not just that I can just say, that's my new martial art. Because if I could just do that, then there it would be a pure flat relativism. And what everything is just a martial art. So there has to be something that we're grappling with. Now, I'm working not primarily in a martial context. So I'm actually totally, <laughs> un except for the sake of example, I'm uninterested in the, in the concreteness of, 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 of the, the fighting, the competition, or the violence as, a, as the realness. If you expand to a larger context of embodied practice, what happens with the realness? What kinds of realness remain uh, that, can, that can counteract that, that, that sense of a relativism that anything, anything goes, anything is possible? So looking for that, that realism, I started to think across different kinds of embodied practice. And I'm going to hit you now with several 
videos at the same time. It's a little bit of an intense slide. I've been using it for many years, and I really, it really means a lot to me. Uh, I just invite you to think about them in terms of similarity and difference as you watch. So look for similarities between them, but also look for differences between them. Uh, they are looped. I'll give you a minute maybe to, to just enjoy. So let me invite you to give me in one word, anybody can call out a word, uh, in one word, what's, a, what's an axis or a dimension or a lens that you might use to analyze similarity and difference across these documented practices? Form creates mind. Okay. Form creates mind. So, okay. Sorry. Come back to that. No, it's fine. I'm trying, I, I'm trying to apply, like in some of them form creates mind and in others it doesn't or something like that. So I'm looking for something where you could say some of them work in this way, some of them don't. Uh, obvious ones, for analysis one. How would you analyze the, the, this landscape? Touch, okay. Circularity. Circularity, okay. Closeness. Movement. Movement, sure. Scripted. Scriptedness, scriptedness, yeah. Expression. Expression. Balance. Balance. Black and whiteness, right? Well, let's say time history. There's two yeah. different time periods. We've got the 30s and we've got the, about the 70s. Identity transformation. Identity transformation. I mean, nobody so far said gender. Nobody said nation, although there's a huge flag up at the top. Um, and, and I've also, I've noted nations. So in addition to name and this kind of a name of a technique, I've given you a nation and a date. Um, there's age going on here because I've included a practice that involves young people, very young people. Uh, yeah, so these kinds of things. I like that um, a lot of people started with more technical language. Obviously, it's because we're at a, a conference with a lot of practitioners. So I before saying the, uh, the historical era, the gender, the, na the nation, the age, people are saying balance, movement, expression, how scripted or how repeatable is it. It's all of those things, right? And all of these ways are things we can, anal we can use to analyze the large field of embodied practice. I chose these because, for me, these are the examples of embodied research, some of the examples of embodied research, that we should have in our mind when we think about embodied research. Embodied research is a term that's often used by people who are scholar practitioners. Uh, I think in most cases, I'll be bold here, uh, but let's say at least in many cases, uh, when people say embodied research, they're talking about a kind of what I would call interdisciplinary research, in which embodied research plays usually the secondary role. Uh, so the thing that's making it research is a historical framework, a historical question, maybe as we saw this excellent example from Daniel, uh, a sociological question, an anthropological question, uh, what do the people over here do? What, are, what is their approach to life? Uh, and then embodied research could be a method, part of the method, to go in and, and, and figure that out. To come, to come out with some new knowledge. But the new knowledge, the addition to knowledge exists in that, in that first field, in the primary field. So if I want to know what people over there do, how it's like for them, I can go and do an embodied practice with them, uh, an ethnographic perhaps. Uh, then I can come back and I can, I can write something about it. What I'm writing about is something about <coughs> what they're doing, maybe my experience in relation to what they're doing. This is a different kind of, of research, uh, and this is what I want to, to talk about. These people are inventing, I'll call it inventing technique, uh, but whether or not you want to go with me on the concept of technique that far, they're inventing or discovering, and that's a delicate balance, they're inventing slash discovering some possibilities which then circulate more generally. So after this you have other people doing the plastiques, after this you have other people doing dance movement therapy, modern postural yoga, Aikido, some going across the world, some ending up making a lot of money. But you didn't have quite those things before, and I don't just mean the name, right? It's not just that the name, because actually the name postural yoga, <laughs> Krishna Makari would not have been interested in um, at all. It, it, it's, it's, it's the technique that I'm talking about. So are they inventing it, 
or are they discovering it? That's not really, that, that opposition is the one I'd like to resolve. What I think is clear is that they're wrestling with the question of what's possible to do in particular areas of practice. What is possible to do? And they're discovering new possibilities. So how do we think about this kind of research? I don't think it's enough to use the frameworks of the other fields that we're putting in dialogue with it, the historical, the sociological, the anthropological. Those are all very important. Um, but I want to look at this kind of research where actually they're not doing sociology or anthropology uh, or, 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 or history. They are doing the field that they're in. So they're doing martial arts or they're doing dance or therapy or theater. That's the field that they're in. That's the field that they're making their contributions to. How do we map that? What I don't want to do is provide anything like a comprehensive map, try to provide anything like a comprehensive map of embodied practice. We could use something like movement or expression or scriptedness. Richard Schechner is someone who has tried to do this, although it's argued, I mean, I don't, I don't think he would say it in this kind of way, but uh, there have been many attempts to, okay, let's map this larger field. Uh, Laban is another example of someone who's trying to take a big area and provide a map for it. That mapping is part of this research. It's part of the development of practice. So that's not the level that I want to work at. I want to actually think about the process of the mapping, the way in which these forms could develop, the way they disappear, those kinds of flows. How am I going to do that? I'm going to use, or I'm going to propose that we think about something called social epistemology, which is kind of a big word. It's got some other alter ego words Basically, it's the sociological study of science. Now, I, I, I don't want to dwell here because there's much more than I want to share with you, and uh, that's a lot of what my book is. But let me just give you a couple points of what this is. Let me clarify also one thing. This is not the application of the scientific method to embodied practice. That's something which a lot of people are very interested in with very good reason. Particularly, everybody seems to want to do brain scans of embodied practitioners. Like, let's brain scan meditation people, martial artists, athletes, singers. My hunch is you kind of get the same kind of a brain scan with these different <laughs> practitioners. So you're not getting into the differences, and this is one of the issues. You, you, end up with, you end up with brain scans because that's your methodology. So I'm not talking about taking scientific methods. Um, in fact, social epistemology is not about what scientists think scientists are doing. It's about what sociologists think scientists are doing. That's much more interesting for me because it's people coming from a very socially, uh, sometimes ethically and politically informed backgrounds, coming into a scientific laboratory and saying, what are these people doing? <coughs> right? And what they've said over many decades is, well, look, these people are clearly doing nationalist projects, yes. They're clearly performing gender in some really intense ways. Uh, they're clearly dealing with issues of capitalism and colonialism and exploitation, right? But it wouldn't be possible, or it ended up not being, clearly not being possible with science for them to say that that's basically what they're doing, that basically it's a nationalist project. Because if you just say that and you don't recognize that the scientists are grappling in a very real way with something that's real that's not nations and cultures and identity, you really can't understand what's going on in the laboratory. You can see how they're doing their identities, but you can't get, uh, you can't understand why they're doing this stuff with the proton or the protein or, or whatever it is. So that's what social epistemologists have been grappling with, and I found when I started to read it that it applied better than anything I'd ever read to what I understood from my different embodied practices. Uh, just a few things that I'll come back to. They applied this to the objects, so that's the, in, for these people, social epistemologists, that's a protein, a photon, the DNA molecule, right, these things. Um, for us, we can talk about what are, what are those, and the other one is disciplines. So we'll look at these two things in application to embodied practice. Then getting to the other level, how does that affect the documents that are produced in this kind of research and the institutions that are supporting this kind of research? That's where I want to end up. But let me start, I'll try to go very quickly here. You can definitely, we can talk, I could talk for three hours about just applying social epistemology to embodied practice, but that's not, I won't want to spend the whole time on that. This, however, when I read this, I fell over, almost. I want to characterize objects of knowledge, epistemic objects, in terms of a lack of completeness and lack in completeness of being. The everyday viewpoint, it would seem, looks at objects from the outside as one would look at tools or goods that are ready to be traded further. These objects have the character of closed boxes. In contrast, objects of knowledge appear to have the capacity to unfold indefinitely. But this also means that objects of knowledge can never be fully I, I read this and I thought, this 
precisely describes my experience of how market forces and other kinds of pressures force practitioners, I'm thinking of actor training, I'm also thinking of dance, <coughs> I'm also thinking of styles of yoga, but of course martial arts, to present what they're doing as closed boxes that are ready to be traded further, ready to be bought and sold. Uh, what would be the perspective from which we would open those up, from which we would treat them as unfolding objects? Uh, does it say unfold? Yes, this word unfolding. And I thought, this, is, this has been my experience. When I learn some pattern, it could be a vocal or a physical pattern, I go into it, then I go into it more. One thing she says that's not here, the more you go into it, the bigger it gets. That's not how it works with, a, with an object you buy from the store. You buy it, if you look at it too closely, there's nothing, you know, it's like, well, in fact, that's not true. But when, when you open it up, if you open it up from an epistemic perspective in a research way, it gets bigger. And that's what happens with, well, I'll say a song, because that's where I'm headed, uh, with a song. But you can say a taolu or, or something like that. Um, you go in and then there's more. It's not that you go in and you dominate it and it closes off and then you have it, you mastered it. Uh, that can happen. You can use it as a building block, but then something else appears. Uh, so that's, one, that's about the objects. Let me say a brief thing about the disciplines. Uh, the idea of the disunity of science, the disunification of science. So there was a massive kind of almost like a culture war, but unfolding over centuries, about whether there was just one science or many sciences. Uh, and it's exactly this, uh, this, this kind of thing where uh, there was this great desire to have sciences unified. And you can unify the sciences in, in maybe a couple different ways, but basically you have to end up kind of putting them together in a puzzle uh, or a hierarchy and saying, well, actually, um, Sure, there's biology, but you know, biology, if you knew all of chemistry, you'd be able to figure out biology. And actually, if you knew all of physics, you'd be able to figure out all of chemistry. This was this idea. It's a hierarchical system, everything. Eventually, there w eventually, we will have the one real science that embraces everything and will know how to handle the world, right? It's a very specific cultural project. If we get rid of that, we see that uh, there isn't a hierarchy. Biology is not sitting upon chemistry, which is sitting upon physics. Maybe in some ways it is, but not in that way. Not in the sense that you can derive or reduce from one level to the next. No, they're incommensurable, is the word from, from this kind of language. They're incommensurable. They're different approaches. But they're not totally different because they're all dealing with reality. So we're back at the problem of realness. They're grappling in different ways. And I found this an extraordinary metaphor for why there are these diversifications of styles, sometimes an explosion of styles, right? Because if you find out one thing, uh, if you invent one possibility, if you say, wait, what if, what if we do it this way? Or if you invent one weapon, suddenly there's many possibilities through that doorway. And then you can have a, an explosion, and within a few years you can have 10 schools, and they're fighting about which one is the best way to go through that doorway, and which, which avenue should you follow after that doorway. So I'm talking about pathways a lot, and I think this, there's many ways you can think about this stuff, but I, the, the metaphor that I'd want to leave you with is how we think about the pathways through practice. That's what I call technique. But just in terms of pathways, I invite you, uh, when, whenever you, a fun thing to do is to, to read something, and every time you see the word way, extend it to pathway, and really think that it's a pathway through a material possibility. Now, it's not a pathway through space, but it's a pathway in the sense of if I do this, then this becomes possible. Uh, if I don't do that, then the second thing is not possible. And if I don't do the first thing, maybe I can't even understand what the second thing is. So there's a directionality. Uh, and because it's research, because you're grappling with realness, most pathways don't work. I think this was, uh, this was what I heard in, in when Daniel was saying, uh, there were 18 possibilities, but 16 of them were obviously wrong. Because most possibilities are obviously wrong. That's what makes it research. That's what, makes it, that's what gives you the feeling which, this, which Satina is fantastic at describing. She calls it libidinal, which is really nice. This feeling, because it's, it's sensual on some level, this feeling that there's something out there that you're wrestling with, right? Wrestling in this kind of very push hands way, where there's something there that pushes back because most of these things are just dead ends. Could we do, no, no, could we, uh, uh, maybe we could, no. Ah, this one, and that feeling of ah, this one is the one that gives you the feeling that you're discovering something. So how do we imagine that? The easy way is to imagine a kind of this kind of a tree. I'm going to call this the structuralist tree uh, because it's very schematic. And if you have someone who really wants to schematize a practice, they can kind of force it into this kind of a shape. They can say, right, there are four that you must learn, and within each of the four, there are three. And everything is very symmetrical. Uh, you, you can do that, but uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a mathematical fractal, but it's not actually what fractals look like. It's still 
too simple. It's not what nature is like, and it's not really what the feeling is like when you're in practice and you're trying something and you're trying another thing. This one works, this doesn't work. You don't, it, you're not sitting looking at four clear roads, right? It's not like that. It's much messier. It looks more like an actual tree, which is an actual fractal, which is not a, not a total fractal, but it's a fractal development that's a branching. It's a continuous branching, but the branches are, of di first of all, the branches are of different sizes. So it's not, now there are four choices. There might be a big choice and a kind of little choice. The little choice might lead to something really interesting. It's harder to locate yourself in this. You can't just say, I'm at node three, right? It's much more <laughs> complex to put yourself in a lineage. Uh, this is how I'd like us to think, and then I'll go on from the theory part. This is how I'd like us to think about, first of all, the objects. So thinking about the different kinds of things, again, I'll just say song, but you could read it as taolu or anything, um, that we go in and it's fractal, so we go in and, and, and then there's more choices. And then we go in and there's more possibilities, and we're always searching, and most of the space is white, meaning most things are not possible. Uh, I can't jump up and then while I'm in the air, stay there for five seconds and then also, you know, I can't close my eyes and then also see, can but, right, I, so there's, there's pathways, there's clear pathways. I can do this and then this and then this and it constructs this kind of, so thinking about the objects, but then of course also thinking about the disciplines. This is kind of the, the, the main thing that I've tried to develop in that book. And now um, maybe we can go on and think about what's coming after, which is, what does that mean about the documents that might be produced? And we started with four videos, archival videos, so let's look to current documents uh, and the institutions. So starting with documents, what if I want to make a video of my training, but I want to get this across? I don't want to say, here's the form. What if I'm struggling with this question that was raised in a panel today? Um, once I capture it on video, it's just that one moment. It's just that one performance. And then it gets locked into that performance. And they look at it, and uh, they just see that performance, and they don't know which of the details are important. They don't know which, because you just see all the details. You see everything that's there. And you don't know which are the ones that you should follow to get to the next steps, and which are the ones that are incidental or contingent to that moment. So, Maybe that's an unsolvable problem. But certainly we've now had several decades of talking about how words fail to capture this, right? How words are, and they don't fail totally. And I think Daniel's point about um, that it's, it, there, there's a degree of where the words are dependent on a shared community of practice. So the more you share practice together, the more you can talk about certain things. But words have their limitations in relation to embodied encounter. But I'm talking about, I want to talk about video because I think video is a totally different animal from both writing and lived encounter. And I think that although we've had 100 years of cinema, uh, we have only just recently had wild explosion of really inexpensive and globally distributable video. So we're, we have video now on a totally different scale where we all, almost everyone in this room has a video camera in their pocket. Some of them are out right now. Uh, and if they want, in a second, they can make that available to anyone who has internet access. So we're looking at a totally different scale. What is that mean, what could we do with it? So I'll, um, I'll share with you this little prototype. Now, I'm not putting this prototype out as paradigmatic, either in the practice documented or the techniques that are used to make the video. Both of them, I want to be really super humble. They're just my little attempt. Um, the training you'll see is this training that comes from Massimiliano Balduzzi. Uh, it's a physical theater training, but I think you'll recognize elements of balance, whatever. Um, and it's whatever it is, it's something I sometimes teach to students. As far as the video itself, I've tried to do a few different things. I'll tell you a couple things that you could look out for here. Um, overall, look out for the density. So what I'm trying to get in this video is density. And I guess I'm using that somehow, I could say also transparency, that would be maybe a more contestable term. Um, but I'm trying to contrast this with a promo video because, I, I, so I'm working in theater, a lot of people are making trailers for their theater productions and the trailers are like movie trailers, they, you know, and so incidental music, right, is one thing. Use a lot of incidental music, it gives a big feeling, but it's the opposite of transparent in terms of what's actually happening. Um, but density is another thing. Density is coming from my enjoyment of reading scholarly works and my feeling that well, when I read a work of popular nonfiction, which I sometimes do, I often find it a little bit boring, uh, even if the content is interesting, because it's not dense enough. 
Uh, it's just kind of like this, and then this, and then this. It's like not intense enough in some way. And then I read a book of academic work, and it's got footnotes and parentheses and more complex sentences and a more complex, it's got a more precise use of language. And I'm, 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 I'm more, it's grappling with me in a more intense way. So I'm trying to get that kind of density in a video of training. Um, the way I'm doing that, three things to notice. Textual citations and annotations, which you can see. Embedded photo and video, which you can see. And continuous time code up at the top, which is just important because that will allow, theoretically, somebody who might want to um, reference what I'm doing. Ah, hold on, that's the wrong thing.
Okay, so again, this is just a, this is just like a, a prototype, a possibility. Thinking about for me, thinking about how could I get some of this kind of density uh, and layering, and also how can I think about the archive and make the archive available. So here you could see, for example, just in one exercise, my teacher and my student. Uh, it's my student, I mean, this is the second day he's working. Um, but you can see these different people all doing the same exercise, right? Um, and you can make your own assessments. So you can look at something, you can choose something in what my teacher is doing, and you can say, ah, that aspect wasn't really transmitted to Ben, or it was transmitted to Ben, but it hasn't gotten to Chris yet. Uh, but maybe something else has gone. What's traveling, what's not traveling? You can look at it. Uh, and that's, that's the difference. That's what video gives us. Uh, and of course, video doesn't capture everything. But Video captures some things, and I don't think we know yet what video captures because we haven't had enough time to actually play. We're just starting, starting to play. Uh, now that, however, is that's what I'd call a training video uh, because that's not. I wouldn't really say that I'm doing much that I'm doing research in this, let's say, sequence of exercise actions. This approach to physical training. This is Massimiliano's research. He invented or discovered it through a long embodied process of embodied research. Uh, he taught it to me and I use it because I, uh, I teach theater students and it's a good physical training, but I also use it as a base, as a foundation for my research, but my research is in song action. So I'm interested in the integration of body and voice, but more specifically uh, in the possibility of action, which is a very specific term in the history of Western, of European theater making. Um, but let's say it's something that is like movement, but it's maybe not exactly the same as movement. Uh, it's some kind of movement maybe, or movement plus something, in relation to song. That's my field. Now I use this as, among, uh, as one of several different kinds of physical preparation that lay, a, that lay a groundwork, that create a technical basis on which to explore song action. I was going to do the, the video. Uh, so I wasn't going to show this, but actually I think it is, it is essential, and I wanted to show it uh, to, to, to give a sense of what this practice is. Several people have asked me in the last few days what, what what style do I practice, right? And I don't practice any martial art, but I, I, have a, I, I practice something. <laughs> um, but it's not doesn't exactly have a name. I named it Song Action. I really don't like that name. If anyone has an idea for a better name, uh, you know, I'm looking for one. Um, but I'll give you a sense. I don't know if I'll play this whole thing. Maybe I'll jump around a little bit because so, that I can, so that I can get to the rest of what I want to say, the last section. But I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of what I mean when I talk about the integration of song and action. <laughs> It's very dark.
But so this is a theater piece. Um, but, but of course, one of the things that's most interesting for me about the whole process of making this theater piece is this conjunctions of song and action. And I found no way to articulate that within the frame of theater and performance studies, except as preparation, training, it's not enough. Um, because I don't think I've seen anyone integrate body and voice in that particular way. And there's different criteria for research, right? One of them is uh, newness, and one of them is importance. I make no claim to importance. I'm not trying to like say to anyone, come train with me. I know how to integrate body and voice. And that would be another way to go. I could market it and say it's really useful for training, for whatever. Um, that's not what I'm doing. In fact, I'm trying to exclude that and instead say, ah, but it's new. No, no, but it's, it's really new. It's actually new. So to do that, there has to be this epistemic context. There has to be a, a, a way of saying, what's the epistemic context? What are the knowledge fields, the kinds of song, the kinds of physical training, the kinds of movement? Uh, in relation to it, I can make a claim that something is uh, new in that research way, which is very different from saying, I've got the new style that's awesome and you should come do it. It's a much more, in a way, I, th I feel it's more humble. It another way, it's more bold. Um, but it's the scholarly way, it's the way academics do it sometimes, and I like that about at least uh, the way that academia runs in general, if not always, which is that claim, which is that, 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 that small but bold claim, that humble but bold claim, which is, I don't think anyone's quite done this before. So that's what I think of as the invention of technique. Um, and I was interested to just kind of do a little tiny poll, and then I'll go to my concluding section. Um, Raise your hand if you've done any embodied research. Good number of folks, maybe half. Um, raise your hand if you've ever discovered any technique that you, that you just kind of came upon. Still a good number of people, maybe less, maybe about the same. Um, and raise your hand if you've actually invented technique. I think a smaller number. So these are related claims for me. That I'm not trying to draw any big distinction between those, but actually kind of show the continuity, um, but to, to focus on that idea of where technique comes from. Now, so this book, I call it a post-structuralist account of embodied knowledge. Post-structuralist is just a kind of fancy theoretical way of saying all that stuff I said, basically taking that tree that was really symmetrical and had these really clear, like there's four and then there's three, and saying, nope, it's not going to be like that. It's never going to be like that. Anytime you make a map, that's part of the process already. So instead, we're just going to talk about mapping in general and how complex and wild it is. That's what I mean by a post-structural account of embodied knowledge. And what am I trying to do since then? What, are, what And in fact, I'm also talking about places that I think we could go as a field, whoever we is. Well, the first thing is to get from the account of embodied knowledge to the practice of embodied research. I think we've talked about that. Uh, and I think, for me, the difference between those two videos, the first video I showed you because it's showing the density of the video, but it's really a training practice. The second video is, for me, research, but I haven't yet tried to make that into a, into a document. There's another aspect that I need to bring out, which is that, for me, the post-structuralist this kind of breaking down, this, this possibility of saying, of thinking about how the similarities and the differences can be allowed to be continually mapped in a complex way rather than uh, tried to be held tight. That has a politics to it, but it's deferred. It's a little bit under the surface. And in my book, it's very clear. In the introduction, I talk about some potentially political context for that kind of approach. And then I say, I can't really deal with that in this book. That's partly because it was written as a dissertation uh, in a program that's fairly conservative methodologically, very conservative methodologically. Um, and so I didn't feel that I could grapple with those political issues. I also felt just kind of overall, if I grappled with the political issues, it would undercut this kind of almost hard quality or dry quality, almost like a, an academically uh, martial quality in this claims that I was making about realness using social epistemology. So I left them aside. But they are vital. And now that there's uh, you know, a little bit of kind of, now that, now that anybody is thinking of using this book or thinking of going forward with it, I think I'll say I, very personally, but also we, as in anyone who's interested in that project, um, need to add some things to the post-structuralism. I'll put up two terms, and we won't be able to go deeply into them, but basically it needs to be decolonial and it needs to be ecological. And I'll say a little word about what I'm kind of gesturing there towards, towards there. Um, we are talking about knowledges that we know are very tied to identity, and we've been talking a lot about national identity. Uh, when we talk about knowledges that are coming out of a historical European identity, or a historical Chinese identity, or a historical... Uh, uh, 
Japanese identity or a contemporary Chinese, Chinese identity or a contemporary indigenous identity or a historical indigenous identity, which we were just talking about in the last panel, all these different things, they are not symmetrical. Uh, they are not simply a pool of knowledge upon which we can all equally draw. Uh, and I think there's actually a risk, a big risk, in the way that I've discussed this knowledge, that it can be depoliticized because it can, be ma it, it can say, well, we're grappling with realness. I mean, we're dealing with balance. Balance is universal. All humans deal with balance. Or breath. Breath is the thing that I kind of come back to as like, there's no one who's not working with the technique of breath. Uh, so we're all dealing with breath. Therefore, techniques of breath belong to all of us. Therefore, uh, let's share and, and, and everybody should share and we should be totally open. Uh, and there's something important to be said there, but there's a lot of history on us. And uh, it's not the time that we should be saying, uh, let's throw open all of the knowledges and we don't even have to talk about who they belong to or whatever because actually none of that matters. And, 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 and uh, more importantly, because no one would say that explicitly, we shouldn't treat them as symmetrical. We have to look at the history. Now, history is not only colonial. That's one big aspect of history. And in the places that I'm looking, that's really important. So it's not that I can say uh, this, uh, this uh, well, the example of, of things we're talking about, like indigenous tradition and a, and a reconstructed Western European tradition, that's very clear there's a colonial encounter there that's not a symmetrical situation. We can't treat the knowledge. The tech. We have to know that there's a realness thing there, that there's a, there's a knowledge there which is universalizable, it's transmissible to anybody, but that doesn't mean we should just transmit it in a totally free way. Ecological, I hardly need to say. It feels a little bit silly to say that we're on the brink of a major crisis of our species, but uh, we are. And there's, I, I, what I will say is that I think I've encountered a lot, maybe more in dance than in martial arts, but in a lot of embodied practitioners, there's a feeling that by working with the body, by focusing back on the organism, we're somehow allied with uh, the movement that, that, that would like to make our whole society ecologically sustainable. I hope so, um, but I don't think it's clear. And I think in a lot of places it's kind of assumed. I, I feel like, well, I'm talking, you know, hippies, right? I'm talking about hippies. Um, and other people as well. But there's an assumption, right, that if we're, if, we're, if we're going back to the body through meditation or breath or, or any kind of martial art, we are being ecological. In some way, we're being ecological because we're using our body, but the, it's so much more complicated than that. So how do, we, how do we get to that? So I'm talking about large kind of framing ideas. That, and, 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 and what I'm asking in this context is how do we bring those into the practice? What does that even mean? I mean, there's countless books, academic and not, about the need to decolonize knowledge and about the ecological implications of our society. But what does that actually mean? I mean, in a martial arts studio, in a dance studio, how do you get there? Um, that's my question. So I'm looking for a post-structuralist, decolonial, ecological practice of embodied research. I'm looking for this. Uh, maybe other people will help me look for it. Maybe other people already are. This, now I'm just going to close with talking about two projects that I'm working on. One is my own embodied research, and the other one I open to you to help me with. Uh, this is a project that I've been working on for a long time in the sense that I've been working so I worked for about eight years, very, to summarize, I worked for about eight years training and then my own research in, in song action. For a long time, I'm not going to go into this. I work with a bunch of people who work with um, traditional songs from various cultures. They take the songs, they make theater out of them. Uh, there's these questions of identity and nation and appropriation exactly as we've been talking about. So then for a while I worked with nonsense invented songs because I didn't want to deal with those issues of the politics of the songs. So I made up the songs you heard in that last piece. They're invented. It's an invented language. It's, it's, it's precise, but it's totally invented. It doesn't mean anything. At least that's on the surface. I mean, actually, on the level of technique, I am, of course, using technique from the people I trained with. But at the level that Western culture identifies a song, which is just the melody and the words, pretty much, uh, they're invented. Um, so I was working with those songs in order to postpone those political questions. And then I said, OK, I think I've done some research there. I think I have some way of working with songs. What if I now work with a really loaded, difficult, complex identity category that I happen to belong to, but in a really complex, loaded, difficult way. Um, then what? Then I suddenly have to face all of these questions and be like, well, but wait. Uh, OK, I'm Jewish. But um, I didn't grow up with these songs, so I can learn the song. Right? So some of the same things that we've been talking about, learning the tradition, reincorporating the tradition. Which aspects of the tradition? Who do I learn it from? Very complicated. As a research question, I've come to formulate this question, can there be decolonial Jewish song action? It's a very kind of technical question, right? On purpose. 
it's got all these qualifiers on purpose because it's supposed to lead not to quantifiable research. I'm not trying to do a scientific method or get any measurements out of this. I'm trying to get new technique. But it should be really specified new technique because the, the criterion should be that no one's ever done that kind of technique before. Uh, not that no one's ever done that performance because obviously no one's going to have done exactly what I did, but that there's some area of technique that no one's ever done before. So there's this collision here uh, of the fact that it's song action, which is a very, in a way, technical embodied research about integrating the, song, the, the, the body and song. Um, but I want it to be Jewish, which I guess obviously means I'm going to use Jewish songs, right? But um, what are Jewish songs? That's a huge category. How do you choose between them? Um, how do you, what kind of politics are in the choices that you make when you're collecting Jewish songs from archives? Uh, and basically my question is, can that, can there be a decolonial approach, a decolonial stance worked that goes all the way through so that in the approach to the choice of songs, and I'm just saying songs because that's my research, but I think it clearly applies to, to, to elements of martial practice. In your selection of what to train, how to train it, who to teach it to, uh, have you framed that in a way that, if not decolonial, that's aligned with your values, where you feel that the practice is continuing those values, and particularly if there's a research component, if you're inventing new technique, what kind of new technique are you inventing? I'm not going to say more about that. This is another prototype. It's longer. It's got, it, 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 I don't think it's as good. First of all, it's 20 minutes, which is harder to structure. Uh, second of all, it's research rather than training, which is harder to capture because I don't quite know what I'm exactly trying to capture. Uh, and third of all, I'm working with song, which means I can't juxtapose two versions of a song in the same way that I can juxtapose two versions of movement. Anyway, problems, problems. I'm not going to go into that. Instead, what I want to do by pointing to this is to say that I think there's a big, big territory of video and what video can be in capturing all kinds of embodied research, physical, vocal, and more. I mean, I put dance movement therapy up there very intentionally because that's outside the realm that we might think of if we're in a kind of certain kind of a focus of embodied practice. So that kind of video, I'm, I'm working on, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to develop my own embodied research. I'm trying to make a powerful video document of it and see those possibilities. But I also felt that I needed to make space. Uh, I need to try to make space for that kind of video because what I realized is when I got this funding, oh, I didn't tell you what the funding is. Just briefly, the funding will allow me to hire two people full time for six months to work in a studio laboratory to professionalize the laboratory. So I've been working with students, um, but obviously if I can work with people at a higher technical level, we can have three bodies in the space. And of course the identity question is who are the people? Am I, am I choosing them for their skills or am I also choosing them for their cultural background? Does cultural background include a level of skill? All these questions. Anyway, when I got that funding, one of the things I need to do is of course produce outputs that will share the new decolonial Jewish song action. Um, I can write about it, but we know the limitations of that. So I'm going to try to make a video of it. Where am I going to publish the video? Hopefully in the Journal of Embodied Research, which, which may exist. This is a journal that I'm building. It's in the process of being uh, voted on by a open access digital publisher who would allow it to be published online. Um, I have a very strong, I think from my assessment, very strong editorial board. So that will allow it to have some gravitas when and if it does launch. But the main thing about this journal, because there are a lot of open access, wonderful open access journals that are coming up in this new universe of open access, but this is a video journal. It's a peer-reviewed video journal. So the Journal of Embodied Research is the first peer-reviewed open access academic journal to focus specifically on the innovation and dissemination of embodied knowledge through the medium of video. And then embodied knowledge encompasses a wide range of fields and disciplines, continually undergoing transmission innovation through practice, including but not limited to those that support the globally diverse performing martial healing and ritual arts. So there, I'm laying out a little four-part ma uh, map so I can reach out, hey, martial people, you know, but I'm, I'm not solidifying it because that's just a little sketch. It's not the big map. Um, so there will be this journal, and it will have videos, and that will be a space where someone can make a video. And I hope they don't look anything like my prototype videos because I, I think that, 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 that there's a huge territory to be explored, right? This is in fact that example of a threshold technique, in this case a threshold technology, where you go through the threshold technology and there's a whole world of fairly easy, amazing discoveries to make that no one's ever made before just because no one ever went through that threshold before. So I'll close with some questions for martial arts studies. Um, they are just questions. You can do whatever you want with them. Uh, and I organized them around those same categories that we were looking at before, which is the object, the document, uh, sorry, the object, the discipline, the document, and the institution. You'll see that I'm just formulating some of what I've already said in terms of martial arts studies. 
and that's how to, in, how, to in, how to enact interdisciplinarity with the martial arts practice. Now, this is a problem that remains unresolved as far as I'm concerned in dance studies, uh, in theater studies. Uh, uh, dance studies is, I think, the most advanced from my perspective. Theater studies is lagging behind. I don't know how it is in sports science, and I think it's quite different. I have had a little experience with that, and I think it's another universe, but also worth thinking about, of course. Um, but how do you get that interdisciplinarity so that it's not that the martial arts practice is the object of study, and you study it, even if you do embodied research, but you come back and you contribute to your home field, which is not the practice? Can we contribute to the practice? Very interesting. I was at a conference just a few months ago where the whole conference was focused on the connection between actor training and martial arts. And it was based on these people who were, they were actors in a theater company and they were working for many, many years in martial arts, official martial arts training context, going back and forth. Fascinating. Um, hope some of those people will get into this network. Um, but one of the questions that was first raised was, clearly you're bringing a lot of knowledge from those martial arts training situations into the actor training space. Is any knowledge going back in the other way? Are you bringing any of the kind of um, changing pedagogical ideas, any of the kind of different performances of gender and hierarchy, any of these other things that we do in the actor training space? Are those coming into the traditional martial arts? It was seeming like in that context, not so much. So that's a big, that's a question. How to get that interdisciplinary relationship, that relationship of incommensurable fields of knowledge. How to produce both technique and practice as epistemic objects. I'm thinking re embodied research embraces both because embodied research can include ethnographic work where what you're looking at is the practice, that, the, that you go somewhere and you try to, you, you learn about the practice, but it can also include technical knowledge. How to produce robust documents I've discussed and how to structure decolonial ecological institutions is a major question, uh, but I, I, I'm not expecting anyone to answer it, but I, I think it needs to be put out there because, uh, because of this way in which when we, if we talk about the circulation of knowledge, that can be depoliticizing, and we need to explicitly fight that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's kind of where I'm at in my thinking. So I, I, I don't know that I can give a really reflective answer. I'd like to give an answer that's from the practitioner perspective um, because that's in one way the, the kind of motivation here. Um, I go in the studio and I do some stuff. I move around, I sing, maybe alone or maybe with other people. If I videotaped that, then in order to give it context and make it mm, in a way that I feel comfortable circulating, I may have to do a lot of editing. But the base material appears because I made a video document of my practice. So I start with something that I can work with. If I'm writing, when I come out of the studio, I have nothing. I have to start writing. And then I face all the questions of what am I going to write, what's the voice, et cetera, which I think are, you know, on some meta level, the same question. So how do I contextualize it? Who do I cite? Who do I reference, et cetera? But I'm starting from scratch with the process of writing. And for me, th there's, that's, the, that's kind of the, the base practical difference is that if I think the live practice, the training practice, the teaching practice, the research practice, if I think that moment is important, 
then there's a, there is a different kind of immediacy whereby that can arrive to me, to my editorial capacity, as a bunch of materials. And if I've recorded 300 hours of materials, let's say, then I have a big editorial work. But I have this thing to work with that has a, it has a more direct relationship. It's not a transparent relationship. It's inflected by all the things you're saying about the documentary questions. But it does arrive to me as material documentation of what I did in a direct way, where if I'm just going to write or if I'm just going to write, it doesn't. I, I suppose you could, you could say that if there's someone else in the studio writing, then that's going to produce that material, and then I could edit it. So I have to think about that. But I know that for me, um, I've wanted to, I've, I've wanted to create a scholarly frame that can put me in the studio more. So I'm thinking, well, if, if one of the things I'm trying to do is collect a lot of video that I can then edit, that puts me in the studio. Uh, whereas if one of the things I'm trying to do is like write another book about my practice, that takes me out of the studio. So that's, I think that there's, that, that's a kind of concrete difference in the technologies of writing and video. Um, what's to be done with it, I think, is, is, is more open. And for me, it's really an exploratory and experimental question at this stage. I'd like to pick up on the question of the decolonial. So you've now had two and a half days of martial arts studies inflicted upon you. Uh, and you have thought about these questions, obviously, with voice and, and other types of performance quite a bit. What would a decolonial institution for the practice of the martial arts, the, the traditional martial arts, look like? I think it's one that tries to address the continuation of relatively recent history uh, in its institutional structure. So it's one that when creating its institutional structure, which is how it's, I mean, it could be everything from how it's financed to who's running it to what the sections are, et cetera, and who it serves, um, is in a way just kind of aware of current power dynamics globally. So um, not buying into the vision, let's say the neoliberal vision of the market, where because all of these kinds of knowledge are available through YouTube, then uh, everyone is on an equal playing field except for money in terms of access, but saying, well, okay, there's technological accessibility, there's money, um, but then there's also w what are our different stances to it. Uh, so, so I think it's, I mean, I'm not going to say what the stance should be because I think it would totally depend on the specifics of what the institution is trying to do. Um, and I certainly wouldn't, I think the traditional martial arts are in a way beyond the pale for me because those are, in many cases, powerful institutions. And I'm used to thinking of, well, I'm, I'm negotiating because I'm looking at, for example, uh, an Israeli archive of songs, but the songs might be Sephardic. So uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, and the, 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 the kind of power dynamic of Jewish identity in the 20th century is um, unlike any other, as far as I can tell, uh, in terms of its absolute objection and genocide, and then complete absorption into a colonial project. So. That's a very particular thorny issue. Now, if you're looking at an organization that's dealing with European martial arts or Chinese martial arts or indigenous martial arts, then it's going to be really specific. But it's just to say that those questions matter, um, that the writing, the writing and the thinking about um, those issues of power and identity matters. And it needs to, it needs to sink down into the level of technique. Uh, not immediately necessarily, but it's, it, they need to be in, in a dialogue. Uh, the technique isn't, it's not free. It's not, uh, I mean, we, there's pharmaceutical companies dealing uh, um, indigenous knowledge about plants, right? So we could say don't do that because you're a multinational company. But if we're setting up a martial arts school, it's not a multinational company that's going to be in that. So it's really dependent on what the institutions are that we're talking about. It's just about putting that question into play at the level of I technique. Guess my question is free from whom or free from what? Because if, as I immediately start to think about this, I think about my own martial arts background. So, okay, Wing Chun is a Chinese martial arts. So that means like, you know, Chinese nationalism needs to be represented. No, wait a second. Right. No, it was a regional.
traditional martial art, right? right? So that means that it needs to be Guangdong, no, or is it what's going on in Hong Kong now? And of course, yeah. there are people who will make arguments, oh yes, this is our national heritage, right. or this is my expression of a local heritage or a regional heritage. And so, and so I, as a researcher, I'm really thrown right back on, well, choosing the one that I like, which is pretty much what I was going to do to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really don't want to claim to have answers to that. I, I think I just want to say that there's been a lot of thinking about that from the perspective of um, research and articulations of these existing practices. Mm -hmm. I think if you're, if you're talking about inventing technique, there's new questions to consider because um, this, you know, the question of how you relate to the name, like does it have to be that name? Um, you're actually, so when you do something, when you invent a new name and you say now this is spat song action, that kind of a move, um, that's not, it's not just a market move. That's not just to be assessed in market terms. That's to be assessed in terms of, of also power dynamics. Yeah, I mean it's not launched yet, so well, I, I know, it's I'm open. Saying, I want everyone to it's submit. Like right up to our alley. Yeah. Um, and but oh, so I just wanted to engage directly with this, like the whole framing of decolonial. Yeah. Um, especially around the issue of Judaism. Yeah. Um, I'm pro commerce. I come. I see myself as in a, a lineage of traders who have traveled the world, the whole world. Um, learning stuff, taking stuff, buying stuff, um, taking it somewhere else, making it cooler, selling it back to people, um, whether it's, you know, whether it's cultural or it's whatever it is. Um, and I think that's really awesome. And I, I live in a zero sum world. So this sort of claims of the ecological, to me, the, the measure of morality uh, in regards to ecology is if you use it, make it more beautiful. But there shouldn't be any limitation on using it. You know, that's my you know, reframe the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, in in terms of the of the decolonial and and sales. I mean, if you're if you're painting a picture of like a merchant who's traveling, um, I mean, what is your responsibility if you're a merchant but you, you well. What is your responsibility if you're a merchant, but you discover that you're a merchant who's paving the way for empire that's going to appropriate land? Do you still just go about your business? I mean, maybe. I mean, it, it's not. It's not. It's not strict because we don't. You know, you can disidentify with the empire and say, "I'm just doing my merchant business." I just think it's a question that should be in the well in the room. But I'm also talking about institutions, right? I'm not talking about an individual who's like, "I'm a merchant." I, I you know, I'm talking about. Okay, are you going to set up a organization? Is it going to be substantial? Is it going to employ other people and serve people, etc.? That maybe comes with a little more responsibility in terms of those issues. Um, and then with the ecological one, I mean, the one that, I, that always kind of hit me, um, which is, it's really simple, and, and maybe it's kind of too, too, too obvious, but um, <coughs> there's, uh, there's, this, there's, this, there's this book that, that, that there's, there's an article that's kind of written in a kind of pointed way towards uh, international gatherings of climatologists who are all flying to meet each other to discuss <laughs> climatology and putting so much and such carbon in the air. Now, if they're really the top people in the world who are going to discuss and solve the climate problem, then it's worth it, right? But what if they are yoga practitioners and they're doing yoga partly because, I say yoga because it's so fashionable, because it's so ecological and it gets you in touch with the earth. <coughs> but the way to get in touch with the earth is to fly to India. So you fly to India maybe a few times to get in touch with the Earth, but you're producing that much carbon. And I'm not trying to reduce everything to like how much carbon do you produce, because it's obviously much more complicated than that. But I don't think it can be easily set aside. Like we don't have to worry about it. I think we do have to worry about it. Um, at a certain point, you uh, were wondering about whether. I think you were talking about the fighting monkey. 
people when you said uh, you're wondering if all the fabulous work they're doing for dancers is going back into martial arts. And something that occurred to me while you were saying that was I, I would really have a hard time imagining interdisciplinary crossovers like that influencing a cliched image of a martial arts studio where you know you go in X number of nights a week and you pay a certain amount of money and you wear a uniform and you follow this very standardized curriculum. However, since I did that about for about 13 years and then I it was just sort of fate I had to move. And so now I really only have ever worked with weirdos in parks and basements. Um, other martial arts may share this experience. Uh, and uh, that experience is, because it's so informal, suddenly a lot of our preconceptions about it, what is actually a martial arts class? You know, I, I, the other day I took out right. a belt that I wore. It used to be black, and now it's like pale blue. And I haven't worn that thing in maybe 10 years, and I wondered, wow, I wonder if I can still tie this. Because yeah. the one's world can really, really shift. So the feedback, what I noticed in these informal circumstances, is I'm not just getting necessary feedback in from theater per se, but they're, they may be hierarchical, but they're weirdly hierarchical. Yeah, <laughs> maybe yeah. they're, they're strangely social. So I do think a lot of the types of exchanges you're talking about are happening, but they happen in these little, uh, little pockets. They may not happen institutionally. Okay, that's where, no, exactly. But that's why we need a robust concept of research. Because the, I wasn't talking about Fighting Monkey. I'll get them in a second. I was talking about the overall body constitution project at the Grotowski Institute. And in that context, those labs are people training in very institutionalized, very established institutions, going into a theater situation that's quite held as theater. So you get the idea that there's a one-way traffic because you have this kind of, I'm talking at the institutional level, you have an institutional imbalance. Um, then there's all the scrappy places where stuff is happening that's neither theater or martial arts, that doesn't have to name itself in those ways, that can be in the interstices and in the interdisciplinary pockets, that's doing all kinds of interdisciplinary in interesting stuff. How do you get that kind of space to exist at an institutional level? I think it can, and actually the reason I like Fighting Monkey, one of the reasons I like the Fighting Monkey people is that they're claiming a space of research. They're not saying this is dance. They used to be a dance company, but they're not really, they're not really saying we're a dance company. They're certainly not saying this is martial arts training. They're actually trying to say, hey, we're doing a thing. It's called Fighting Monkey Practice, and then whenever you try to nail it down, they're working against that. So that for me is opening an institution, starting to open an institutional space of research where you can have those complex interplays and you potentially can have that at a larger scale. It doesn't have to always be in the dingy basement. Thank you very much.